In the last video, we finished contingent valuation problem number six. So next, we're working on problem number seven. The difficulty here is that the contingent valuation question is usually hypothetical. If you ask somebody, how much are you willing to pay to clean up the air in Salt Lake City, or even uh, specifically, how much are you willing to pay to reduce the number of so-called red air days in Salt Lake City uh, by 25%, People may not know how to answer that question because they've never th thought about it before. It's a hypothetical question. You can't buy, buy clean air at the grocery store. So the neoclassical assumption that people are rational and know their preferences breaks down in, in situations where people are faced with novel questions. So this is a... A, a pretty fundamental problem with contingent evaluation. It's, it's the flip side of contingent evaluation being able to, to ask anything. You know, with contingent evaluation, you don't rely on the availability of market data. You can ask people anything. But on the other hand, people haven't thought about things that don't involve, they haven't thought about how much they're willing to pay or how much they're willing to accept for things uh, that they don't have any experience with, which means things that, that, that they haven't traded in the market before. So the flip side of being able to ask people questions that don't involve market transactions is that they're unfamiliar with these questions and, and, and uh, would have difficulty answering them. This is related, but somewhat different to the last year, problem number eight, um, information quality and understanding. There was a so-called blue ribbon panel uh, established by the Environmental Protection Agency in the early 1990s to, to give the Environmental Protection Agency advice about whether or not to trust contingent valuation. And the, the EPA intentionally chose people to be on this panel who are not environmental economists, who are other kinds of economists people who didn't use contingent valuation in their own work. One of the people was uh, Kenneth Arrow that we studied uh, early about with the impossibility theorem. And this panel, in, in its final report to the EPA, said that, yes, contingent valuation is trustworthy as long as the, as long as the respondents, the people who are answering the survey, have complete information about the environmental problem that you're asking them about which means not only that they have the amount of information, but that, that they can also understand the information that's given. This raises a lot of questions. First, suppose that it's an environmental problem that's rather well understood by scientists. The question then that's raised is, how difficult is it to impart, impart the information to people who are responding to a survey? A, a long time ago now, more than 10 years ago, we had a visiting professor from Istanbul in Turkey who was an environmental economist. And he did contingent evaluation surveys in Turkey. He used PhD students to help him out. And he said that when a PhD student would, uh, who's trying to take a contingent evaluation survey would knock on on somebody's door, uh, on, on, the, on the door of, a, of somebody's home in order to give them this survey and identify themselves as being a graduate student from, from a university, the typical response of the homeowner would be they would invite the student in, ask them to sit down uh, and have a snack, and be perfectly willing to spend 30, 45 minutes listening to the student showing photographs and describing the, I think it was a beach in the uh, in Istanbul that they were, they were uh, trying to do a contingent evaluation study on cleaning up this beach. So showing photographs of the beach, showing sketches of what it might look like after the cleanup, uh, really getting into some detail about the type of pollution that was there and the damages that were caused, and then taking a survey about willingness to pay and willingness to accept. Now, in the United States, it's much harder to get people to give you your time, unless, you, unless you're paying them for their time, which is pretty expensive. 
I, if a PhD student were to knock on somebody's door, I think a lot of the time nobody would answer, even if somebody was home. And if they did answer, you know, they might be willing to give you two or three minutes of their time, but probably not anything more than that. So how do you impart this full information and understanding of the information in such a limited amount of time? I think it's impossible, and therefore you'd have to pay people to take the survey, and that makes it much less practical to do surveys like this. All right, so that's a situation if scientists do fully understand the environmental si situation. How about something like, what are you willing to pay to alleviate global climate change? Uh, scientists have been... <laughs> working on understanding climate change in some sense for more than a century and quite uh, quite a lot um, expending a lot of effort for maybe the last 30 years or 40 years and scientists still don't know a lot about it i mean scientists do know a lot about it but certainly don't know everything about it uh, these earth systems are incredibly complicated you have the atmosphere, which is a really complicated system. You have the oceans, which is a really complicated system. You have the links between the atmosphere and the oceans. Then you have the land, and you have low altitude land and high altitude land and you know different kinds of, of precipitation, like is it rain, is it snow? Uh, then you have um, the incoming solar radiation, and, and so it's really complicated. Um, what does it mean to that you can trust people's answer to a contingent evaluation problem about global warming if you give them full information and complete understanding about global warming. Does that mean that before we ask people contingent evaluation problems, we have to have them get a master's degree in atmospheric science? And and and, and what if they don't do well in their in those courses? <laughs> then maybe they don't have full information, so then we can't ask their opinion. So in other words, this 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 response that, oh, well, contingent evaluation is okay as long as the people have full information and understand it, really raises more questions than it answers. Although it's hard to know what the alternative is, just let experts decide. Um, and, and certainly there are people, not really economists, but there are people in other disciplines that say, yes, we should just let the exp experts decide what public policy about something as complicated as global warming uh, should be because they're the ones that understand it. And economists tend to not like that answer because we want to be more democratic. Uh, now, economists don't, don't mind not being democratic in the sense that you know, contingent valuation, especially willingness and ability to pay, depends on your income. And so it's not, it's not a democracy where everybody has equal weights. If you, the more money you have, the, the bigger your weight. But... It is democratic in the sense that it doesn't depend on whether you're an expert in the subject or not. And so this this raises questions which would be hard to answer. I mean, um, experts are the ones that understand it, yes, but, um, but if we just let experts make the decisions, then they won't understand all the implications of those decisions, the trade-offs for everybody else in the economy, or, or, the, or at least they, I mean, they probably won't understand it, and, and it's not very democratic. All right, final final point here in Chapter 8. So, um, obviously, <coughs> excuse me, obviously, contingent valuation has a lot of problems, but hedonic pricing had problems, travel cost method had problems, and if you don't do these things, then you don't assign valuation to environmental amenities, uh, then, I mean, th that that has more problems than any of these. So, so it's interesting to... to to, to think about how, given all these problems with all these methods, can we say anything about their, how accurate they're likely to be? And one really interesting way of approaching this is to study environmental problems, environmental policy questions, which, which give rise to, to valuations that can be studied both using more than one method, for example, the travel cost method and contingent valuation. Now, the, or hedonic pricing and contingent evaluation. Now, these are, of course, completely different methods. And so the question is, if you use these completely different methods, how close do the numbers come? 
and I think this is the this kind of study is the best we can do to answer the question of how how much trust should we put in these methods now lots of environmental problems c can only be studied by one of these methods let's say just by continued evaluation but there are a few that can be studied by more than one and i want to turn now to a handout that illustrates that and on the <coughs> On the uh, on the website on the web page, there's a link to this handout. So this handout comes from a textbook by Pearson Turner, who are two of your three authors. This is a the book that I use or I have used at least for Econ 5250, uh, page 170 uh, 152, and it compares. Okay, CVM is the contingent valuation method. So I just usually use CV. They use CVM, and it's comparisons of the contingent valuation methods with other techniques. So what you've got on this page is studies starting in way back in 1966 and, and ending in the, in the early 1980s of the contingent valuation results, which are going to be, uh, which are going to be in this column. And then, so that's expressed preference. And then the revealed preference results, which are going to be in this column. So for example, take, take uh, the Kinesh and Davis uh, study, which is a really classic uh, study the the first one that tried to put dollar values on on an environmental amenity. So their contingent valuation results <coughs> was a dollar and seventy one cents per household per day, and they also studied it the same question using the travel cost method and got a dollar and sixty six cents per household per day, which is I think really quite remarkable, extremely close. Um, <clears throat> Next one, uh, hunting permits, 1979, Bishop and Haberline. Contingent valuation, $21 per permit. The travel cost method, well, depending on the value of time, which we talked about, um, that is the opportunity cost, <clears throat> they got anything from $11 to $45 for the value of hunting permits. So $21 seems to be... I mean, it's 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 close to 28. It's not very close to 11 or 45. So that shows the sensitivity of the travel cost method to the value of time. Now, I mean, you could get at the value of time by asking people, let's say, their wage rate, but people often don't want to tell you what their wage rate is. So um, what else? Here's a water quality improvements. Um, the improvement. What if you couldn't can't use it at all? How how bad is how bad would things be if you couldn't use the water at all? Uh, if it's um, if it's not even boatable, then B. If it's boatable to being fishable, and if it's boatable to being swimmable, uh, swimmable means even even better water quality than, than fishable. S so you get contingent valuation numbers here, and again the travel cost method gives user values here. Well, 21 and 82, that doesn't look very close. 12 and 7, 29 and 14. <coughs> um, some of these numbers are closer than, than others. Um, here's a travel cost method and contingent evaluation for cleaning up water quality in some lakes in Texas. So you can compare these numbers here. with These are the three different lakes to the uh, travel cost method uh, numbers here. Some of them are really close, $13.01 to $13.81, and some of them are not, $35 to $102. Um, <clears throat> this 1981 paper by Thayer Recreation Site compares the the um, contingent valuation, not the travel cost method, the ones we've been talking about up to now is travel cost method, but site substitution. So this gets back to the, this is the replacement cost method that we talked about as a non-demand approach. And their numbers are pretty close, uh, two dollars and fifty-four cents uh, value per household per day versus two dollars and four cents. Air quality improvements, poor to fair and fair to good, monthly value by contingent valuation here, and then you use the hedonic pricing method on property value, so real estate, the standard way to use hedonic pricing. Um, Fourteen dollars versus forty-five dollars, twenty dollars versus fifty-nine dollars. Um, versus fifty nine dollars. So well, uh, I mean, um, not close, um, but 
you know, differing by a factor, what, four or five um, in the first part, three in the second part. Um, so they're not differing by a factor of 20 or 100 or 7,000. Municipal infrastructure in three different cities. Elasticity of substitution of wages for infrastructure. So this is, these numbers here are the, uh, essentially the slope of the demand curve. And technically, elasticity of substitution means it's the slope of the demand curve where you measure both price and quantity in their logarithms rather than in their values. Um, and here we have hedonic pricing method on wages, so your lost wages. And these numbers are, um, let's see, I guess we only have a number. Um, let, let me pause that for a sec. So the contingent valuation uh, study was done in a way that generated uh, three numbers here. The con the um, hedonic pricing method study only generated this one number, which is uh, not far away from the other three. And finally, the last one here, um, natural hazards earthquake information. Um, the contingent valuation gave $47 a month, and the hedonic pricing method on property values gave $37 a month. So... <coughs> Here's the um, here's a reference. Obviously, economics is a social science, not a natural science. Um, and so we're not going to get agreements here that are usually at least that in the order of one percent or five percent. We're going to get sometimes numbers differing by a factor of five, but rarely by something like a factor of ten. I think what what this shows, and there there are modern examples of these kinds of studies too. But I think these old exam old, old studies are. I mean, if anything, the modern studies would be closer. I, I think these old studies are, are are revealing enough that putting economic value, putting dollar values on environmental assets, is not totally arbitrary. Despite all the criticisms that your textbook and I have made about these studies. The result is not "quote unquote" junk science. There, uh, people are definitely willing to pay for environmental improvements. Um, they care about the environment, both their own environment and the environment of of other people, uh, separated from them in in geography or in time. So, well, I don't know quite what else to say. It, it, Assuming that external cost exists and is a real thing, I think is a, is quite valid. I think it is the right way to th to for an economist to think about environmental problems. Um, when politicians say we're talking about uh, the environment versus the economy, that's a false dichotomy. The economy certainly, the environment certainly has economic value not only instrumental value, but uh, all other kinds of values, including aesthetic values and bequest values and all the other values that we studied. It is true that it's hard to get good numbers on what those values are, but we can certainly get some numbers and those numbers are not, are not arbitrary. So I think the conclusion of of this table is fairly positive. We have to be humble about what environmental economics can do, but not only conceptually, but also practically and, and with, with real data, uh, I, I do think there are certainly things to work with. And it would be a mistake to say that because of the difficulty in measuring environmental values, we shouldn't measure environmental values. That's that's really no excuse. Just because it's hard doesn't mean doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And and certainly saying that because it's hard to do, we should act as if all these values are zero is completely wrong. All right, I think that concludes chapter eight. Yes, it does. 
And so chapter 9, we'll start in the next video.